thank you for joining us today for this continuation of Calapaba's APAs versus Hate Conference. My name is Zathrina Perez and I'm the current president of Calapaba. I will be moderating today's panel on APA women, hate, gender, and race. Before we begin, I wanted to recognize our very generous sponsors, Davis Ray Tremaine, Hanson Bridge, Procopio, Squire Patton Boggs, Wilkie Farr and Gallagher, the Dolan Law Firm, and donors Oric, the Northern California chapter of the Iranian American Bar Association, and our other individual donors. I also want to thank our 28 community co-sponsors for their support and allyship. In addition, the purpose of this conference is to inform and inspire action. If you're willing to serve as a legal referral for victims of hate incidents or hate crimes, please contact us. Um, and we'll be presenting the link right here on the screen. Uh, you can volunteer at bit.ly uh, backslash APAs versus hate. Please also contact us if you're interested in, in donating. All donations that we collect will go directly to Stop AAPI Hate and the API Legal Outreach. Today's panel is intended to set the table for what we hope to be a more extensive discussion in our community on the experiences of APA women within current events. Most relevant to today's panel, amidst the disturbing rise of anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents across the country, APA women appear to be experiencing the brunt of these incidents. Nearly 70% of people reporting hate crimes and incidents to stop AAPI hate over the past year were women. Stated differently, women reported anti-AAPI hate incidents 2.3 times more than men. Against this backdrop, we also have seen brutal attacks against APA women literally from coast to coast. A 65-year-old Filipino woman in New York City recently, 75-year-old Chinese woman in San Francisco, six Asian American women in Atlanta. We submit that there are deeper issues at play here. We believe that a fulsome understanding of these recent acts of hate requires diving into the intersection of racism and sexism and anti-Asian violence within the United States. We need to understand its roots in history, politics, and culture. We hope to begin to explore these issues with our panel of distinguished speakers today. On our panel, um, I'm very pleased to announce that we have Sunghyun Chamorro, Executive Director of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. We also have Christine Ahn, Founder and Executive Director of Women Cross DMZ. And finally, we have Professor Nancy Wong Yu, Associate Professor of Sociology at Biola University and author of Real, spelled R-E-E-L, Inequality, Hollywood Actors and Racism. Each of our panelists will be presenting key background context on the intersection of racism and sexism in anti-Asian violence. After we have that context, we will then engage in a discussion with our panelists regarding how the hate acts that we are seeing against APA women today fits into that background. We invite the audience to type in their own questions into the chat box so we can include these questions in our discussion. So let's dive in. We turn to our first speaker. As executive director, Sung Young leads the overall strategic and direction and sustainability of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. The NAPAWF is an organization, and in fact, the only organization out there that is focused on building power with API women and girls to influence critical decisions that affect our lives, our families, and our communities. Sung Hyun is a contributor to the HuffPost, among other news outlets. With her incredible activist background, Sung Hyun has been a strong presence in the public discussions regarding recent anti-AAPI attacks, appearing on CBS This Morning, being quoted by many news outlets. I turn it now over to NAPAWF Executive Writer, uh, Director Choi Morrow. 
Thank you so much, Athena, for that introduction. Um, thank you everyone for being here today and for hosting. Um, as Athena mentioned, I am Sangya. At NAPHOF, we've been focusing on the intersection of racial justice and gender justice going on 25 years this year. Um, and you know, one of the things that I've been saying often to reporters this last few weeks is that, you know, we've we've been raising issues that impact our community, especially in the intersection of race and gender. And you know, like you're finally paying attention. And really, I'm very angry and upset that it took the death of eight people, murders of eight people, especially the six Asian American women who were targeted to get us. Uh, to the point where our, our country is having this reckoning moment. Um, and of course, that's happened in the backdrop of the increase in violence and, and harassment incidents that's that's happening to Asian Americans across the country uh, because of the coronavirus and the rhetoric that our former president um, you know, espoused and led with that has put a giant target on our backs. Um, and so, you know, it's 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 in that context that you know we're having this conversation. And I just, you know, wanted to thank everybody for being here, but especially for Asian American women who are, you know, feeling all sorts of ways. Like, you know, know that you're not alone. That um, there are to this spotlight that we've we've been uh, put under. Um, one of the most striking things um, that I have realized as I have spoken to, you know, by the end of the first week, I had spoken to over 60 reporters and had been on, um, you know, or had been on um, different interviews. And one of the most striking things that I experienced was how shocked uh, the journalists were at the stories I was telling them about the experience of racialized sexual harassment and racialized misogyny that Asian American women experience in this country. They had no idea that many of us are targeted uh, for sexual harassment because of our race. And it was just um, in some ways very uh, shocking to me that it's such a universally um, experienced, um, it, it's a very universally shared experience of Asian American women, yet so many especially people, you know, doing journalism and media work did not know. Um, and so one of the ways that we we have come to talk about, especially the Atlanta shooting and the motivations of the killer, um, um, it, as it relates to Asian American women is that, you know, as you all know that, uh, you know, the, the killer, well, the, the sheriff's department said, well, it's not a racially motivated crime because that's what Speck said, and, you know, it was only motivated by, um, you know, it was an act of sexual deviance, right? And and uh, to me, those two things can't be separated if you understand the history of uh, how Asian American women are treated in the United States. And so I started making that connection as a way to give, the, like, to logically argue why it was a racialized crime. But in that process, I had no idea that I was educating so many people in our country um, about racialized misogyny and sex, uh, sexism that Asian American women have experienced, you know, since the 1800s, uh, starting with the Page Act. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're for, for NAPOF um, in this moment, it's really about making sure that we don't lose sight of the that these women were murdered, not just because they were Asian American, you know, it's not like they just happened to be women who, you know, they were targeted because they were Asian American, but they just happened to be women. They actually were targeted because they were Asian American women. And I think that's really important for us to remember as we continue to uh, talk about the Atlanta shootings um, in relationship to the increase in hate crimes that's happening. Um, Related and unrelated, uh, prior to the Atlanta shootings, uh, NAPOV has been raising awareness and, you know, trying to raise more uh, visibility around the fact, you know, that just Serena mentioned the statistics that, you know, uh, of all the uh, hate incidences that were collected by Stop API Hate, close to 70% of them were experienced by women. 
Um, and I'm sure you all have also heard anecdotes, but you know, um, just to give you some sense of that, um, in you know, NAPOF staff and our members, when we had started talking about possibly going back to work after the initial shutdown, you know, we had no idea what this was going to look like, but we went into lockdown in March. And as we were having discussions about, you know, what does reopening look like and when do we reopen, the number one reason people gave to not wanting to go back to the office was the fact that they would have to commute and they were they were frankly afraid for their safety more than catching the virus that's how seriously this uh, the hate crime the the hate violence and harassment against asian american women is prevalent across the country um, and so i think we need to also remember that as we are talking about these incidences and hate um, why are women being targeted more and why is it so disproportionately being targeted at women and at elderly and really finding a way forward that centers um, uh, women and the elderly in how we address uh, the violence that's happening to our community. Um, NAPUF uh, commissioned a, poll, a polling of Asian American Asian American Pacific Islander women voters who had voted in this past presidential election. One of the questions we asked them was if they had experienced uh, some sort of racism or racialized harassment in public in the last uh, year. Over 50% of the people who participated in our poll said that they had experienced some kind of racialized incident um, in public. Um, so this is, you know, tracking with the number of, in, you know, the the ratio of incidences that a stop API hate is collecting, that it is, you know, overwhelmingly um, impacting Asian American women. I also want to add that 75% of the people we polled said that they're dealing with anxiety, depression, or stress, or other mental health issues related to the virus, whether it is directly um, in relation in relation to public it, or it, it whether it is uh, because of other um, issues that are uh, related to the pandemic. Uh, thing to know that um, along with the data that's more than seven, uh, close to seventy percent of the hate crimes are directed at women women and in, um, in the stop API hate crime. Um, I have to say that uh, one of the things that they also observed is that women are more likely to be targeted in public by strangers. That that is the, the predominant way that women experience racism as it relates to the pandemic right now. So um, I think that, you know, we need to be aware of that. And of course, you know, even, um, you know, even in this environment, I mean, we did see you know, this whole polarizing with China. And I know um, Christine Ahn's going to address that more, but, you know, the Biden administration also has a responsibility, right, um, in how we talk about our relationship to China, how we talk about our trade, um, you know, the, their trade policy, our trade policies and the like, and that it continues to put a target on on our backs um, as we escalate these, uh, you know, these this rhetoric. So, you know, I think we have a lot of work ahead of cut, cut out ahead of us that we need to um, think about. And I think, you know, um, we can have a, a more uh, interactive discussion um, with Christine and Nancy once they've presented. But I just wanted to just give a little background and some um, information about how we have um, been approaching um, and uh, analyzing the work that's been happen uh, the the incidences that's been happening. So back over to you, Zathrina. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Chris. Christine is the founder and executive director of uh, Women Cross DMC, which mobilizes women globally for peace in Korea through education, advocacy, and organizing. They are a leading voice in the movement calling for a formal end to the Korean War and the replacement of the armistice with a peace agreement. Christine also is a coordinator of Korea Peace Now and a contributor to The Nation magazine. 
among many contributions to public discussions regarding the recent anti-AAPI attacks. She wrote the article, Anti-Asian Violence in America is Rooted in U.S. Empire for The Nation magazine. I now turn it over to Women Cross DMZ Executive Director On. Thank you, Zathrina, um, and all of you for joining us today for this really important conversation. I'm really honored to be on this panel with Sung Yun and Nancy, and I'm here to provide some important historic and geopolitical context for the rising violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Today, I'm gonna to speak a little bit about how US foreign policy has played an integral role in violence against API communities here at home and abroad. So on the evening of March 16th, I was having dinner with a Vietnamese American friend um, who was a midwife and over Thai food, we talked story. I'm here in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, we talked about how um, our lives as immigrant women um, were impacted as we fled countries that had been at war with the United States. Um, little did we know that as we reflected on the legacy of war and militarism on our lives, a 21 year old white male had massacred six Asian women at massage parlors in Atlanta. I later realized that March 16th was also the anniversary of the My Lai massacre in Vietnam, where in 1968, U.S. soldiers brutally raped and killed more than 500 women, children, and elderly men. Well, since Atlanta, as Katrina has pointed out, Zhao Zhenji, a 76-year-old Chinese woman, was punched in the face in San Francisco and in New York City. Vilma Kari, a 65-year-old Filipina, was brutally assaulted by a man who shouted, you don't belong here. As Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, we know that feeling of being a perpetual foreigner whether we are recent immigrants or our families have been here for five generations. As we look to ending this violence against us, it's critical to understand how U.S. militarized foreign policy has impacted the crisis our communities face today. By labeling COVID-19 as the China Chinese virus, President Trump triggered a wave of verbal and physical attacks on Asian Americans. But as one of the commenters noted, AJ, um, it's not just Trump who is responsible for these heinous attacks. Underlying Trump's um, blame of COVID on China is the U.S.'s longstanding foreign policy to confront Beijing militarily economically and politically. Both Democrats and Republicans advocate, quote, confrontation and coercion, aggression and antagonism, end quote, to maintain U.S. primacy against China. The Trump administration's national security strategy named China 33 times, and the Biden administration's interim national security policy singles out China as a direct threat to U.S. national security. As my friend Jessica Lee of the Quincy Institute points out, members of Congress regularly harp on China to show their tough national security chops, quote, without any regard for how their out of control language could shape American perceptions of Asians, end quote. Well, one such Republican from Virginia, Congressman Rob Whitman, recently tweeted in response to calls to cut the Pentagon budget that, quote, China's goal is nothing less than the complete destruction of the United States, end quote. Well, it turns out that Whitman receives the greatest campaign contributions from arms manufacturers and military contractors. As Jessica rightly notes, he is part of a toxic bipartisan US leadership, quote, stoking fear and anxiety in order to advance a military-centered US foreign policy towards China, end quote. What we don't see or hear much about is the ramped up U.S. aggression towards China and the ubiquitous U.S. military presence throughout the Asia Pacific region. According to American University professor David Vine, there are approximately 300 U.S. bases in the Asia Pacific region circling China. Um, which along with aggressive naval and air patrols and military exercises, quote, increases threats to Chinese security and encourages the Chinese government to respond by boosting its own military spending and activity, end quote. 
This military buildup is raising regional military tensions. It's increasing the risk of a deadly military clash or what should be an unthinkable nuclear war between two nuclear armed powers, the US and China. Well, sadly, the US's aggressive military posture towards China is in fact part of a long legacy of US imperialism in Asia and in the Pacific. Beginning in the 1850s, the US began its imperial march across the Pacific to forcibly open new markets for its rapid industrialization, starting with Japan, then Korea, then the Philippines. Um, New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman, he famously wrote in 1999, I mean, this is a great quote. I'm not crazy about him, but he said, the hidden hand of the market will never work without, an, without a hidden fist, end quote. Well, as somebody who is based here in Hawaii, um, the Hawaii people know this very well. H Hawaii was once a sovereign nation, but it became the starting point for America's century of imperialism and conquest in the Pacific. According to a longtime demilitarization activist here, Dr. Kyle Kachihiro, he says, quote, white settlers in pursuit of economic profit conspired with the US military. Their interests converged under the unifying ideology of white supremacy, end quote. Well, that's because during the 1800s, white settler merchants, they profited handsomely by exporting sugar from Hawaii to the United States. And so to ensure the continuation of favorable trade terms with the US in 1893, the, the white Howley settlers orchestrated a coup with the US Marines so that Hawaii sugar would not be subject to tariffs. So soon after Queen Liliuokalani was overthrown, which paved the way for Hawaii to be annexed as a US territory into eventual statehood. So as uh, the native Hawaiian activist here, uh, Kavena Phillips says, when they overthrew the Hawaiian kingdom, they didn't just do it to take land from the Hawaiians, to take away our self-governance, our people, our culture and suppress us. They did it so white supremacy would have a base of operations in the Pacific so they could expand their violence into Asian communities, end quote. And as we all know, that's what happened in the 20th century. As the US waged wars in Asia against Japan, North Korea and China, Vietnam and Laos, killing and displacing millions, anti-Asian sentiment triggered violence against Asian Americans at home. We know during World War II, the US government deemed Japanese Americans as a national security threat and forced 120,000 of them into prison camps and later dropped atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, incinerating over 200,000 Japanese lives. When China entered the Korean War um, in 1950, Chinese Americans were, quote, numbed with fear, end quote, ac according to journalist Gilbert Wu, as anti-communist McCarthyist attacks fueled public hysteria that made Chinese American communities vulnerable to violence, including Chinese owned businesses. The US dropped over half million tons of bombs in Korea, leveled entire cities. 80% of North Korea was totally destroyed and used more napalm in the Korean war than during the Vietnam war. And during the Vietnam War, the US splattered more than 20 million gallons of Agent Orange and herbicides over Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, which led to cancer, birth defects, and severe neurological and psychological problems among the people in those countries, as well as returning US servicemen and their families. You cannot inflict this kind of violence and brutality against Asians and not expect that this dehumanization won't have repercussions for Asian Americans. So today, the anti-Asian rhetoric will adversely impact all of Asians in the US because most Americans view us as a monolithic group. We saw this in 1982 during the US trade wars with Japan when two Detroit auto workers, white auto workers, mistook Vincent Chin as Japanese and beat him to death. As Terry Park, a friend of mine who teaches Asian American studies at the University of Maryland says, quote, we are constantly seen as a perpetual foreigner, as never quite belonging to the US, as always being suspicious. And that bullseye gets larger when hawkish rhetoric ensues by US administrations, end quote, as we are seeing today. Tragically, Asian women are particularly harmed by US militarism and foreign policy. Of the 3,800 hate incidents, as Katrina pointed out, 70% have been directed at women. 
exoticized and fetishized Asian American women have borne a dual burden of both racism and sexism, viewed on the one hand as submissive and sexually available lotus blossoms, and on the other hand as manipulative and dangerous dragon ladies. I'm so excited to see Nancy's presentation. So in Korea, women have long been collateral damage from militarized US foreign policy. The 1950 to 53 Korean War, which killed 4 million people, led to social and political chaos, separated families, orphaned and widowed millions, creating conditions where women were without homes and work. This forced women into prostitution. And according to Wellesley professor, Catherine Moon, who uh, wrote the book, Sex Among Allies, over a million Korean women worked in quote unquote camp towns that surround US military bases in South Korea. This system of military prostitution was controlled by the South Korean government and supported by the US military in order to strengthen military alliances. So in summary, if we want to stop Asian violence here at home, we must recognize how U.S. foreign policy perpetuates it and end U.S. militarism and wars throughout the Asia Pacific region. We cannot, on the one hand, decry racism against Asians while at the same time fail to recognize how U.S. foreign policy perpetuates it. Let me close with a quote from Martin Luther King, who in 1967 cautioned that, quote, the triple evils of racism, economic exploitation, and militarism, end quote, were the greatest threats facing humanity. The great problem and the great challenge facing mankind today is to get rid of war, end quote. The Biden administration could start by formally ending the Korean War, which continues to be a source of justification for military center policies um, across the region, US, South Korea, Japan. And as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders with families abroad and facing repercussions of militarized foreign policy at home, we must rise up and demand an end to endless US wars, to the Pentagon's bloated over $700 billion budget and to the 800 US military bases around the world. We must cooperate with China to stop the pandemic and future ones, halt climate change, and build a more equitable global future. We must fundamentally reorient US foreign policy away from domination and control, and instead use the principles of diplomacy, cooperation, and justice to advance genuine human security and build lasting peace for all. Thank you so much. And back to you, Zathrina. Thank you so much, Christine, uh, for both your expertise as well as um, providing uh, real policy issues that are relevant to um, the topics that we're discussing today. Our next speaker is Professor Wang Yun. Professor Wang Yun is a scholar of race and ethnicity in film, television, and new media. Her book, Real Inequality, Hollywood Actors and Racism, examines the barriers of African-American, Asian-American, Latina and Latino actors face in Hollywood and how they creatively challenge those stereotypes. Professor Wang Yun also pioneered the first policy report on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in primetime television in collaboration with Asian Americans Advancing Justice. She is a sought after expert by news outlets such as the AP and New Republic and appears on numerous newscasts. Among many contributions to the current public discussions regarding anti-AAPI attacks, she has appeared on CBS News and discussed the history of hypersexualizing and fetishizing Asian women. I now turn it over to Professor Wang Yun. Thank you, Zathrina, and thank you to my sisters who, oh, wow, Christine, that, that uh, history <laughs> got me all emotional. Just hearing about all the violence and realizing that, you know, this is not just one moment in time, but a series and um, a pattern in this country. So it's it's disturbing and it's enraging, as, as Sanyam said, we, we feel all these feelings of rage and, dis and sometimes despair, but also hope, hopefully. And so I'll be I'll be presenting some um, some slides of how pop culture has also contributed and solidify the objectification and fetishization of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Specifically, I'll be focusing on images of East and Southeast Asian women. Oh, um, oh, okay. 
So we're going to share it. You're going to share it like this. Okay, sure. Um, okay, so this is, um, uh, this is the actually, uh, I think the first representation of an Asian woman in Hollywood. And guess what? It was not played by an Asian woman. Uh, that was a pattern in early Hollywood of yellow face of white actors playing um, Asians. And this is Mary Pickford, who was a huge silent era star. And so she played Cho Cho San, who is, um, you know, the, the star of Madame Butterfly. And that comes from the Puccini opera, which, uh, which first uh, was staged in 1900, uh, 1904 in, in Italy. Uh, but but the idea uh, you can see here, even in this position, this film still of her being um, garbed in in kind of exotic geisha like clothing and in this kind of submissive, um, you know, uh, posture in terms of and being definitely the object of desire. And, and can we next slide, please. And then we have Anna Mae Wong, right? She is uh, arguably the first Asian American born in the US uh, star of Hollywood. She, she never, I think, got what she really wanted in terms of leading roles that, that weren't um, objectified and exoticized. And she was actually outspoken about it. So she's in many ways, she was a very um, uh, ahead of her time. But then most of her roles, as you can see in this dance, um, she's, she plays Shosho in Piccadilly. This was actually one of her better roles, if you can imagine, um, that she was. Uh, she, she went to England to, to, to play this role and she was the lead, but here she is dancing in this kind of Orientalist uh, exotica um, role. And we can see that, and, and her very, her, her career spanned between 19, nine, the 1920s all the way to like early 1960. And, um, and, you know, she played, but she really embodied, I think what Christine mentioned, the, the Lotus Blossom. In fact, her first uh, role in um, Toll the Sea, her name was Lotus Flower. And, and she was also the Dragon Lady where, um, next slide please, uh, where she, uh, she is, uh, oh, no, one slide prior. Is this, oh wow, okay, sorry. I guess I, guess I don't have that slide. So the, the next slide was supposed to be her as uh, as the daughter of Fu Manchu, so she plays in Daughter of Dra Daughter of uh, Daughter of Dragon, and she played the um, the the daughter of Fu Manchu, and so she's literally a dragon lady. Um, if you didn't know, Fu Manchu also was always played by white men, and that that character really embodied the yellow peril. So very much what Christine was talking about in terms of Asia as enemy number one. And Fu Manchu demonstrated that, embodied that in so many numerous movies. And so Anna Mae Wong also played the, the Dragon Lady. And also um, what was interesting, and I think this links to the idea of Asian women de dehumanization and violence is that in almost all of her roles, she said, you know, she said Hollywood didn't know what to do with me. So they always killed me off at the end. She always died at the end of her. So whether it's uh, Madame Butterfly role, which was told to see, you know, the, the kind of tragic death, but or or Dragon Lady, which was kind of, you know, the, the villainess being killed. Um, there was so much violence against her and all her roles. And so she joked that on her tombstone and just say that she died a thousand deaths. So let's move to um, the, the next slide, which uh, which is this is Miyoshi Umeki. If you didn't know, she is the first Asian American to ever win an Oscar. And she won it for this role, which is really problematic if you look at it, right? She uh, she played uh, the love interest of this soldier. And um, in, in terms of progressiveness, they were, um, you know, they actually were married. Um, but you can see that in this role, she's very much a servile um, Orientalist stereotype and she won best supporting actress. She is still the only woman, Asian woman to ever win an Oscar. Um, and so she and she and and the the in the story she and her her white soldier husband actually had to kill themselves at the end of the film because they were going to be you know they were going to be separated and instead of doing that they did a double suicide because but uh, but the moral of it is that you know Asian women cannot have any kind of subject you know subjective agency they they are always objects and they are they have to die at the end of the film. But again, this was an Oscar winning performance, right? Okay, so next slide. So Susie Wong, okay, I, I just read an article where um, women of Asian women of this era were constantly called Susie, right? Because Susie Wong was such a huge 
it was a Broadway play first, and then it was a book, Broadway play, and then a huge movie that that I think propelled Nancy Kwan to international stardom. Uh, but you can see here, she is a prostitute, a prostitute with a heart of gold, but it's certainly a prostitute. And if you note all these photos, you can see that they are all in some sort of ethnic garb. So this goes back to what uh, Sangyan said about um, the, the kind of uh, you can't have sexualization of Asian women without the racialization, right? All of it is intersecting. And so here you have, um, you know, she is, she's, I think she's, she's kind of spicy, I would say in this, in this movie, but in a way that is still, so she's embodying both kind of the, the docile, submissive prostitute, but also a little spicy and hard to get. So all of those, but always wearing, you know, the chi pals and the, and the chansam, right? So that is, that is very much the kind of fetishization, exoticization that um, that is that is just part and parcel of how East and Southeast Asian women have been portrayed in Hollywood. Next slide, please. And so this this movie, which I've never seen, but has <laughs> I think plagued me and everyone of a certain generation in terms of being called, you know, being being propositioned by strangers. Right. So so what Sanyan said about strangers, you know, accosting us in public. I was in Atlanta airport um, going to the, actually an Asian American studies conference. And and I was leaving, you know, having done this amazing thing, going to my first ethnic studies conference. And then I hear this me so horny like in the airport and I look around and I'm the only Asian woman walking. This is the airport. Um, and I knew he was talking to me. And it just that was what I remember from that trip, that horrible. Um, statement and you know I, I it's just like I've never seen the movie but I knew that that was a, a dehumanizing fetishizing statement that was meant for me and so and and you know if you're on Twitter there's so many Asian women who have shared that, that this this line from this Kubrick film has just played them right it's also been used in in music it's just part of pop culture but, but this idea that all we are are prostitutes, right? Are sex workers and objects. Next slide, please. So we go to Rush Hour 2. Oh, wow, Rush Hour 2, a great, you know, progressive movie with an Asian and black lead, right? But this was the scene in Rush Hour 2 where they go to a massage parlor and it's a joke, but it's also part of a fantasy, right? And I'll just tell you, this morning I got an email from an anonymous person who had seen me talk about this uh, this representation in Rush Hour. And he literally said, like, he gave me a whole story about how he went to the massage parlor and had, you know, experienced this exact thing and how stereotypes are rooted in reality. That was the email to me after I gave a, a intellectual, you know, whatever, uh, you know, explanation of the represent, like what I'm doing for you guys. That was the, that was like, I don't, I wouldn't call it a hate email, but it was like, that was the only way he connected with me. You know, the way that Asian women, sometimes white men connect will say like, oh, I, I knew, I know an Asian woman, or I'm married to an Asian woman. I dated, I had an Asian girlfriend, right? These, these kind of statements like to connect with you, it completely like racializes us, right? And of course, again, also genders us. So it, it's all this kind of only seeing you as the only other Asian woman they know. And guess what? This man who emailed me, he knows Asian women as massage parlor sex workers. And so, um, so this is not, this is not just abstract, you know, I'm not just showing you abstract pictures, but literally this is how our experiences are lived. Uh, next slide, please. So this, you know, goes on and on the geisha, right? Remember 19, back in 1913 uh, or 1915, this is geisha, you know, Memoirs of a Geisha 2005. I even read the book, you know, and this is how through a Western lens, how women are, Asian women are seen and the whole conflation, like the three actresses that were actually played this were all Chinese actresses that played Japanese geishas, right? It, it, Hollywood doesn't care, right? And and so um, and so the, this, this demure, um, submissive, and of course, you know, we know that the geisha outfit, the the these costumes that white women, you know, wear on Halloween, we are we are just kind of we're fantasies, not just for I think white men, but we're fantasies, right, for kind of um, white culture. Uh, next slide, please. So, Miss Saigon, <laughs> this is the this is the thirteenth longest running Broadway show as of July, 2019. So it's, it, it started in 1989. That was the first time it was staged in, in England. And this is actually a photo from 2017, a West End production, right? So, so these are, um, 
it's it's not just it's not just Hollywood. It's Broadway. It's everything, right? It's music. Um, I think about so many music videos, and and so this idea that this this pattern, this um, this objectification, it's it is it is deeply ingrained and integrated into U.S. popular culture, where people cannot even tell the difference between me going to as an academic going to a professional conference and this image. Right. We we are we are seen as the same. And so that is um, I just wanted to kind of present um, through through these photos what how much how much this is part and parcel of who of of who how we are seen in society. Thank you so much, Nancy. And thank you to all of you for sharing your expertise and insight on these issues. Um, we are now moving into a discussion portion of today's session. I'll be posing questions to the panel. These questions are intended to spark a conversation. So please do not feel limited in your responses and jump in with your own questions and comments to one another. To the audience, please feel free to continue to type questions into the chat box. Uh, I wanted to start off by saying that, at least to me, there appears to be a higher level of public attention on recent instances of hate acts against APA women than at other points in recent history. Do you have a sense of whether or not uh, that in fact is the case? And if so, what do you think is different now? Um, is there something unique about what's going on now versus what has happened in the past? Maybe we can start off with um, Nancy going backwards. Yeah, I think that it's not like we have more violence now, except I think there is some uptick because of the anti-China rhetoric during the pandemic. But I don't think that um, anti-Asian violence is, is new, especially Christine gave us an incredible um, history of all that. And, and so I think that the fact that we have social media, we have cell phones, we have more documentation, just like the anti-Black violence, we just have more ways of sharing and, and, and going, things can go viral, right? I mean, I, that, that New York uh, Filipina elder who was attacked, I, just, I, just, I think I watched the video a couple of times and then I was like, I don't wanna see that video anymore, right? It was so disturbing, especially the closing of the door that I think that disturbed me more than anything else, but I think that um, these videos are, are being circulated, and so I think there's more interest because we love the uh, news media loves those sound bites and loves those those viralness of, of it all, and I think there is some like violence porn right that's going on, um, which is disturbing for those of us who are you know potential victims and victims of, but I think that it isn't new, but there is there's just more documentation of it. Um, Christine, do you have anything to add? I mean, I just want to um, second what Nancy said and just, you know, reiterate the point that there has been a correlation with uh, when the U.S. is uh, in a hostile a state of relations with an uh, Asian country. It has reverberations back on Asian Americans here in the United States. And um and I and I totally do agree that you know the the prevalence of social media and us being able to share, um, which I think is so important, is um, part of us having greater information and knowledge about what is happening. But I also just want to like give props to both Nancy and Sangyun and and other amazing feminist Asian American scholars and. Uh, just like experts that have been, I mean, I'm just, I've been, and you know, um, the, the Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, you know, um, Viet Nguyen, he's just been like amazing to like put out a really fierce analysis that challenges the dominant white supremacist uh, narrative. And you know, really critiquing the the myth of the model minority, and uh, really showing that there is huge uh, inequality within Asian American communities. Um, and just you know, I just feel like that is what so um, that is the shining light in this moment is just to see that there is a whole generation now of really critical thinkers and empowered Asian American women and feminists that are putting out a different narrative and challenging the existing stereotypes that endanger all of us. And, you know, as somebody who has a daughter who is growing up and thankfully here in Hawaii where the majority is, um, you know, non-white, um, that, you know, there is a hope of a different kind of future. But I just wanna really, 
thank my sisters on the panel for just being out there. And, you know, I know as somebody who is constantly um, red baited and attacked, uh, in fact, my, my greatest Bully is uh, a lawyer at the Department of Homeland Security. He was a former military judge advocate in the U.S. forces in Korea, a white guy who, um, you know, I'm sure part of his like uh, disdain for me is how dare this uh, diminutive uh, Asian uh, American woman like and challenge you as foreign policy. How dare I uh, be part of the democratic process to shape uh, the future of this country and our role in the world. And I just think that, you know, that's what we have to be doing more. We have to make the link between what happens uh, in terms of US foreign policy, because it has implications, not just in terms of the actual money that we don't have to invest in things that make us secure here in the United States. but. As we see, I think most cogently in this rising anti-Asian violence, we have to figure out a different way of how the United States engages with the rest of the world, especially with China. Thank you. Uh, Sung Young, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, you know, we, we can't ignore the fact that what threw us into this spotlight is a mass shooting, right? Um, and one thing that I have said over and over again to reporters is that there are many Asian American women and Asian women who have died because of racialized sexual violence. And we, you know, it, it took you a mass shooting to finally pay attention and shame on you. I think there, the media has responsibility for, you know, going after the sound bites and the sensationalization of, of stories. And, you know, there are millions, not millions, but there are tens of thousands of indigenous women, black women, other women of color they, that, that have been brutalized and murdered as acts of sexual violence that no one is naming. Right. And we are in this moment because six Asian American women were murdered because of their race and gender. And so I, I, I don't think that, you know, and, and it's it's really interesting because literally the week before the shootings happened, my team and I were trying to get in the media to talk about the gender aspect of the increase of hate crimes. And nobody wanted to talk to us. Nobody wanted to cover that story. They didn't understand how it's different for women than it is for men if you're all Asian American. Like literally people are giving me this feedback and this mass shooting happens and that allows us, us to speak. And now finally people are like, oh, and I'm like, you know, I literally said the same things last week mm -hmm. and somehow now you're hearing it, right? So, so I, I do think that, you know, we need to recognize that we're in this moment and getting the spotlight at the expense of eight people's lives. And that really makes me angry. That makes me angry more than anything else. And to say that this is just related to coronavirus, no. Korean women, Vietnamese women, Filipino women, Pacific Islander women have been murdered by US men because of us being targeted as sex workers and sex objects is nothing new. And that is why it was so important for me to make sure that we start there. We start with the Page Act, in fact, right? We start mm -hmm. with the fact that this is not something new, that the fact this has always been the case for Asian American women and not only paying attention because it's a newsworthy story and it will make it on the front cover of the New York Times. And I right. think that is really tragic. Um, on the Atlanta shootings, I mean, there are a lot of aspects of that. Um, tragic, tragic killing um, that really frustrated me. One of the things as an attorney that really, really frustrated me was that as soon as it was publicly reported that the shooter claimed that he was not motivated by race, suddenly it appeared that a lot of people said, well, I guess it's not a hate act because he, he says he wasn't motivated by race. And that was deeply frustrating as an attorney because I'm sure we have criminal attorneys in the audience, but that's not how it works. A criminal suspect saying, I didn't murder the victim. You don't have police officers saying and prosecutors saying, well, I guess it wasn't murder because the criminal suspect says I didn't murder the victim. Um, but for some reason in this instance, the shooter's stated motivation was given credence. Um, would be interested in your thoughts on how that kind of dives into uh, the broader background and context and how um, uh, APA women have been treated in instances of violence. 
Um, I can start. So first of all, our country has a problem with humanizing white male killers, right? This is an issue. It's, you know, when it's somebody else committing crime, it's that entire race that's in that whatever. But when it's a white man, it's an isolated incident because something is wrong with like there and there is an excuse. And this follows the pattern, right? That they're always arrested without being shot. They always somehow survive, come out in, in fact in bulletproof vests in some cases, right? Like in the Charleston shooting. And it's always blamed on some other issue that caused them to do this, right? Humanizing the killer instead of the victims. That's a pattern. Um, and obviously in this case, like, yeah, like, yeah, you had a bad day. You know what I do when I have a bad day? I go eat cupcakes. I bake with my daughter. Like, it's just the, the reasons were just outrageous, right? Even one of the sons of the victim said, like, you don't go kill eight people when you have a, had a bad day, let alone one. Like, that is just an outrageous thing to say out loud. And the fact that the sheriff's office, you know, put their, you know, they don't put their worst person spokesperson out there. That is their best person out there saying this also goes to show the biases in our law enforcement. And this is why we keep law enforcement cannot be our solution, right? To humanize this person to say, oh, the person had a bad day and they they did this because they're just at the end of their rope. Like, I'm sorry, like a bunch of people just went to live about their lives every day. This women went to work and they, they, they were murdered because they went to work. Like, what about that story, right? And so for me, it was really important that his motivation it being, you know, even the words like eliminating sexual temptation. I'm like, that's what I look at all the time as a sexual temptation. That's all I am to many men in this country, right? I, and I think that triggered a lot of Asian American women who came out of the world. Like, that is why it's racist, right? In fact, it is a racialized crime because that happens to so many of us as Asian American women. So, you know, other than yeah. the fact that and does the murderer get to decide what his intentions for the crimes are? You know, that that effect aside, like, even if we're going to go with, like, it was an act of sexual deviance, that is how Asian American women experience racism in this country for the most part. It is in this racialized way. So uh, you can't separate the two. And, and I think for me, that was really important. And that's why I was talking to as many reporters as possible because I didn't want this to be just about the rise in hate crimes. It was actually much longer, much deeper rooted history, you know, going back everything that Christine said, right? All I, you know, I was, I, she, I wish they would publish what Chris, Christine said because that will help you understand why this white man's motivations wasn't just to elimination. So we have a, uh, a number of questions from our audience asking how we as a community, um, the community, large community that we have a, as the audience, APA, female attorneys, um, attorneys, um, and other people who kind of follow Kalapaba, how can we here in this audience fight um, the stereotype of racial sex sexualization, um, fetishization of APA women? Maybe we can, all right, go ahead, Christine. Um, well, I just, I think a, a panel like this that provides a lot of the historic and geopolitical context uh, that really shows the way in which mainstream media has uh, hypersexualized Asian women, um, that, you know, we educate ourselves about this. But just, I mean, it's, again, I, I've been so inspired by the, um, the new generation of Asian American women and scholars, um, and also Asian American men, like my friend Terry Park, who has been speaking out um, and giving this kind of context. And, you know, I think it's so important to see our visualization, see ourselves as experts, see ourselves as um, people that are also shaping such things that have been in the white specter of uh, white men, you know, like such as US foreign policy. We have a role to play in um, shaping what happens not just here, but also what the United States does abroad. And I, and I do really wanna just 
you know, hit home the point that we are still at war with North Korea. The United States has not signed a peace agreement with the North Koreans as promised. South Koreans want an end to the Korean War. Like that is one military conflict that we can end. It'll play a huge role in, I think, diffusing tensions between the US and China. It is in the crossfires of Beijing and Washington. And so we can together as, a community of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders call for an end to that war um, and definitely think about a different way of engaging with China. I just want to make a point that, you know, here in Hawaii during the Obama administration, there was a guy that headed the U.S. Pacific Command named Admiral Locklear. And he actually said that to deal with the greatest threat facing all of humanity, which is climate change, we need to cooperate with China. But instead, Locklear was replaced by Harry Harris, who is now the U.S. ambassador to South Korea, to lead that. He was a China hawk. There is a different way that we could do it, that we can cooperate with China instead of having this like aggressive, hostile um, stance. And we have to, as Asian Americans, like realize that when we do that, it not just affects all the Asian people, but it affects us at home. And so what how the U.S. engages in foreign policy is very critical to how we will be um, held as as humans and and safe and secure in this country. I think we have um, time for just one more question, which is um, how has uh, the Me Too movement, if at all, framed the current public conversation regarding hate acts against APA women? Do you feel that um, it is allowed for APA women to uh, be able to voice um, and be heard more, or has there not been a space for APA women in the Me Too movement? Um, Zathrina, oh, uh, so Zathrina, I just noticed that there were a lot of questions and also a question that flashed across, like how, what can everybody do in order to make a difference? Can I answer that question? It yes. seems like yes. people feel powerless perhaps uh, if we just name the problem, I think. You guys are probably know about bystander training, right? Hollaback and AJC has that. That is really important. I think that Asian Americans, you know, we're thought of as the model minority, right? And I think that, um, as Christine said, you know, so many scholars, Asian American women have, I mean, I, I do media stuff, right? But I've been asked to talk about hate crimes uh, on, on you know, national platforms. And even if it is, uh, it was difficult and it was um, psychologically, I mean, it did cost, so I do, advocate for self-care. I think that we just need to speak up, uh, you know, when when people joke, because people, I think, think of Asian women desirability as a joke or as fun or as light and not a big deal. Um, like what's wrong with being thought of as desirable, right? And they don't see the kind of shadow side of that. And I think that we need to speak up. We need to educate in our personal circles. And if you're an ally, do the same question. It could be in the form of a question. It doesn't have to be like, you're racist, because um, <laughs> that usually shuts down uh, conversations. Although sometimes you need that too. But I think that just asking like, what, why do you think that? What, what is that about? Why are you, you know, you know, that makes me feel uncomfortable. So kind of really being able to, to speak up as, as on behalf of, if you're an Asian American man, you know, on behalf of your sisters, um, and just having those difficult conversations in families and friendship circles and at work. I think we need to, you know, everybody can do that in their everyday lives. Yeah, I, I wanna just um, echo that, that I think, you know, it is just the objectification and sexualization of women in general that also play a role, right? So um, how are, how are you, know, if, if, if if that's something that you think about and participate in, like that also plays into it, right? Just because you're not cat calling me on the street and saying, you know, me so horny doesn't make you not compl complacent, com com complacent, right? Uh, I think to Nancy's point, you know, um, especially as uh, non-Asian American allies, like we need people to speak up and create safe spaces. So this isn't just wait till something happens to one of us, then say that's wrong. Like how are you proactively creating space that's safe? I just learned that Asian American families are least likely to send their children back to school in person because they're afraid that their children are gonna get bullied and um, are gonna experience racism. So if you're a parent and you're, whether you're Asian American or not, like how are you approaching your schools proactively to say, 
what are you doing? Not just to like stop the bullying when it happens, but what are you doing to create a safe space and affirming space for Asian Americans right now? What are you doing to do that? What are you doing to make sure that we, you know, we don't talk about that children hear about the coronavirus and like all of these wrong ways. So what are you doing to change the narrative, even if you don't have Asian Americans and Asian American students in your school, right? So I think it's really that proactiveness that's going to get us out of this. Uh, that will be very important. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we uh, are at the close of our presentation. Thank you so much to our panelists for sharing their incredible experience and insights on these challenging topics. Um, to our audience, Please join us for a continuation of this important discussion with an upcoming panel hosted by the Asian Pacific American Women Lawyers Alliance, uh, APALA. Um, the panel is More Than Meets the Eye, How Gender and Sex Intersect with Racialized Violence Against Asian Americans. Uh, that panel will be on Thursday, May 26, from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, their panelists will be Helen Zi. Uh, activist, author, and former journalist, Renee Tajima Pina, documentary filmmaker and professor of Asian American Studies, UCLA. Jennifer Fang, founder of Reappropriate.co, an Asian American feminist blog. And Karen Wang, professor at UCLA Law and former civil rights advocate. In addition, Calipava Conference will continue with the model minority myth presented by CKA, which will take place on April 13 from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Please register at http um, colon backslash backslash bit.ly backslash Calipaba. Thanks so much for joining us today and have a great day. Thank you.